So hi, everybody, again. Welcome to the second part of the session. I am glad to introduce our next speaker. Oh, sorry, what happened? <laughs> Julie Ranchara from the University of Göttingen. Uh, the talk she's giving today is titled Identity in Emphatic Definite Description. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you for both of you for organizing this, um, um, this, this conference. As probably many, I feel that interdisciplinary workshops and conferences are very enriching. They help us at least um, get out of our echo chambers. So as probably some of you know, I'm, I'm a linguist, so there will be a lot of linguistics things there, but everything what is linguistic is not, will not really be super important. And here's why. Um, what I'll try to do is to offer an idea that linguistics, even in its present state, with all its vices and vices, can be useful for other disciplines and can be used as a tool. Like linguistics already has been used as a tool, and most prominent example uh, is in biblical studies, where I'll make it larger. Um, where, for example, uh, linguistics can, linguistic dating can be used for those scriptures and texts that come as one document, and there is no way to determine whether it is uh, actually written as one document. Um, uh, for example, uh, Tibet Marker is, um, uh, is a Sumerian work that um, describes as events of the time of Moses, and it, it comes with one book, as one document. But then uh, using uh, linguistic uh, evidence, uh, um, lexical as well as we know how diachrony goes, that it can go one way, not the other. So it's been shown that it's actually a composite document based uh, on a uh, composite document that that first two books um, really dated much earlier than the rest four books. So this is a kind of idea that I want to, to do, but now using our uh, semantics, pragmatics and philosophy. So what um, I'll try to do is that uh, try to show or I, I know, advertise is that we can use linguistic intuitions, our naturalness judgments or acceptability judgments to probe into our philosophical ideas or intuitions about how people reason. And to do so, uh, we need to find a linguistic phenomena, which is not, first of all, not language specific, we don't, because linguists know that if a language doesn't allow some construction or uses, uses it somehow differently, then there can be thousands of diachronic and contact language reasons um, and has, which have nothing to do with human reasoning per se. So it should be, and, and uh, of course, uh, universality is a very high standard that cannot be achieved. So we want to, uh, it to be present, this phenomenon to be present, at least in some many unrelated languages. And second, we have, uh, we, we want to have a, a more or less adequate understanding or at least description of this linguistic phenomena, because if we want to use it as a tool, we want to know how we, this tool works, how we can sharpen it or, uh, or what the noises that it can produce. And of course, it needs to be re uh, relevant for, uh, for, for reasoning. So the tool that I will try to show is uh, what I call emphatic definite descriptions. And the, this part of the talk will be mostly linguistic and uh, there will be a lot of um, notations which I left there. If you don't read or don't understand them, you are not you are not losing anything. It's like there is a car and you don't need to have to 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 have perfect knowledge of how all its parts work in order to drive it. But at least you want to to have 
want to have an idea that yeah, it it will it will run, it will go. So I will introduce this phenomena, and then the second part is that I will try to show where we can use it if this. Uh, if I do, if this idea works, and I'm very curious about your feedback, whether that will work at all or not, using this phenomena or using map or maybe other phenomena as well. And before I uh, start describing aquatic different descriptions, so uh, I need to say that I will be using. Um, uh, a, lo a lot of Russian examples there, as my uh, my origin is Russian and I have many uh, access to many speakers there, so the data is very easy to uh, to come by. But I want to, uh, um, to 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 raise my support to the Ukrainian people in this unjustified and, and brutal war. Okay. What are emphatic definite descriptions? Emphatic definite descriptions are definite descriptions in which high degree degree modifier, like English very, are used without an overt gradable property. Very often they are accompanied by a relative class, and this is shown in one. So uh, we can say that there are tall, uh, there are tall men, but we also can say that there are men we met yesterday. And the same can be found in Slavic languages. Um, and here's a Russian example. It's not the, in, in most Slavic languages it's found. So self tall man is literally self tall man, but it means the tallest man. So it's a high degree degree modifier. But we can also say that self man we saw yesterday, which means the same, that there are men we saw yesterday. And free is an example in Lithuanian. Uh, the paths is used. It's also kind of related to a self morphing. So, and it's used very similar to, uh, to Slavic self summing. So, self, uh, uh, self good means the best. That self book means that every book, that, that every book. I will stick to these three groups. What is true for the and it is also true for Latvian and, uh, as I was told, other Balkan, lang so Balkan Baltic languages. So these are the three groups that um, will try to show that this is not a kind of Turkey of uh, English language or Russian language or just one specific language. The use of degree modifiers in uh, emphatic definite description uh, has uh, several properties. And this again shows that we kind of deal with the linguistic phenomena that has its own fingerprint. Um, one pro the first property is that uh, unlike with gradable properties like tall, very in emphatic definite descriptions cannot it's only it's the only degree modifier that can be used there. So we can say that they're very extremely tall man, really tall man, but not the extremely man we saw yesterday. And the same is true for Slavic, and uh, the same is true. Uh, I have Slavic examples there. Um, so the modification is limited to those to, to the very. The second property is that very in emphatic definite descriptions cannot be iterated. So it is possible to say that there are very tall men, but not that there are very men we met yesterday. And again, the same is true in, um, in Slavic languages. Uh, the third uh, property, which I will not be uh, dwelling too much, or that there is an account of it, is that uh, emphatic definite descriptions are not good under what is called constituent negation. A constituent negation is a negation that does not change the polarity of a sentence. So uh, John arrived is positive, John didn't arrive is, is negative, but John talk to nobody is still positive. And then we have a, a, a constituent negation on top of the definite description with very or summary, the sentence is degraded. 
So linguistically speaking, what we want to, uh, to, to, to say is that, uh, to, to find out, to understand is how those uh, um, elements like vary in all across all these constructions work so that they account for the uh, different properties. Modification by vary and summary and parts and similar modifiers is not limited to these two constructions. And I will show two more constructions, which kind of sit in between um, modification of tall and modification of and uh, use in emphatic definite descriptions. So the two cases um, in between cases will be something that I call a precision case, as in 10a. In this, at this very moment, at the very beginning, the very part, these are examples of the precision cases and the modification of same, talking same, that the very same car. Well, again, as I said, we'll see that those two sit, with respect to properties, sit in between um, the very tall and the very tall man we met yesterday. So in precision cases, uh, um, very is used to, uh, to signal precision. As I said, uh, with respect to uh, the dimension that is given by the noun. So the very beginning we're talking about unidirectional uh, kind of time, time, time like uh, scale. Uh, in the very city, we can think about it as a multidimensional uh, space uh, or more abstractly and the very thought. Um, Again, the same is true for Russian and for, um, for Lithuanian. Interestingly, if you think about Germanic languages, English aside, they also have self in those precision cases. So uh, in 14, I show you um, examples from, um, from Swiss, Swiss German that have self in this, uh, that self moment or the self city. You can even think about archaic English expression, the self same, which also has this self morphing uh, surfacing in the uh, precision cases. Degree modifiers in those precision cases, uh, in some respect are like in uh, emphatic definite descriptions, but in, in others are, are different. Like an emphatic different description, very or this morphine that we're using is the only one that can be used there. They really, from the, from, from the really beginning, is not a meaningful uh, chunk. But unlike an emphatic definite description, so uh, those modifiers in, uh, in precision cases can be, um, can be iterated. From the very, very beginning, from the very beginning, from the very, very beginning, etc. Um, now, modification of C, uh, and I will be if probably many of you know that same in English is unfortunately ambiguous between uh, talking a talking reading and the type reading. So I drive a Ford uh, and and so drives the same car can be read either as the same type of the car or the same talking of a car. And again, the, we shouldn't take this as, as something significant because uh, many other languages uh, treat uh, token and type identities with uh, different uh, lexical items. And for example, in German, uh, we have, we have uh, Gleichen as, uh, as a type identity and uh, Zelbe as a, a token identity. In uh, Russian, uh, also, token identity and type identity are uh, lexicalized with different uh, different morphemes. So we we want to dwell on the ambiguity of same in English. But what we'll look is uh, the modification of same with our high degree degree modifiers. What we'll see is that uh, with, like in emphatic definite descriptions, very is the only modifier that can be used there. Um, the very, the, the extremely same car 
is bad. And then I'm talking about English, I mean the inside a, a DP modification. Of course, you can put a degree modifier outside of a DP and say something like roughly the same, almost the same, a little bit the same. Um, but, but not inside. And the same is true in, uh, uh, in, in, in Russian, as I show in 21b. Uh, and like with emphatic definite descriptions, uh, very cannot be iterated in those constructions. The very, very same car is mean, meaningless, unlike the very, very tall man. With respect to negation, it's been uh, argued at least for short, well, suggested at least for Russian that uh, they are that those same uh, modified by summary are also degraded under constituent negation, but the data is kind of very murky there, so I will not uh, um, take it. Um, I, I will not assume it. So as an interim summary, so we have those, we have those four uh, constructions in which intensifier like very or summary or parts can be used and they have different properties there with gradable, gradable predicates like tall. Um, we, can, um, we can use other degree modifiers we can uh, uh, use very iteratively and um, it's fine under constituent negation. Then on the other extreme, uh, we have uh, an emphatic definite description, whether neither is possible, other degree modifiers are not possible, iteration is not possible, uh, and um, uh, constituent negation is, is not possible. And then we have um, uh, precision cases and modification of same, uh, kind of sitting between the two. Uh, now, informally, now we become technicians for our car and to look a little bit of the uh, semantics of how very comes into the structure and does the job we want it to do. Um, what I'm going to um, there, there are two approaches to uh, degree modification now in linguistics. One is uh, that we introduce uh, another argument slot for a predicate like tall degree argument, and then degree modification is uh, doing its job with uh, this uh, degree argument. Another is supervolution, there we define a function with a partial function, which is true with respect to. Uh, and, and use uh, uh, comparison classes so to uh, to set our true values and this is the the, the story that I'm going to uh, to assume uh, based on Klein and most of his what he's saying will work perfectly fine so there is no reason to uh, to change to change much we just um, have will do slight modification to account for emphatic definite descriptions and the rest will be will work fine. So uh, quickly, what she says is that, or this um, uh, part of the, of, of the camp says is that um, uh, sentences like John is tall are interpreted with respect to comparison classes, like John is tall for a football, for a basketball player. So if he is tall relative to a basketball player, he, it, the sentence will be true. If it's not, if it's if he is not tall relative to a basketball players, to basketball players, the sentence will be false. If his height is not comparable to basketball players, the sentence will be undefined. What uh, Klein proposes for very is to formalize Euler's idea that tall means tall with respect to tall people. So he is tall among tall people. So if we say that very is uh, chooses a set of individuals that that are tall, sorry, if tall chooses um, a set of individuals that are tall, then very changes the comparison class and among tall individuals chooses those that are tall. 
this is the job that uh, very is um, is doing and um what it will be doing uh then we come to a compositional analysis is that it will take uh, a predicate like tall in 25 it will raise it to a function from context to extensions it will change the context will modify the comparison class there and then lower the function back into extensions so basically if we want to use uh, that uh, client's proposal if we want to use uh, very we will enrich our semantics in a way so it uh, jumps from the extensions to the um, to uh, to context change the context there comes back to um, uh, to the our extension denotation and then the, the computation continues. Um, so then uh, what we'll say, say that the, the meaning of John is very tall is, is simple, like we did with basketball players. It will be true if John is in the positive extension of tall in, um, uh, in, in the context that our comparison class are tall individuals. This is what C modified by X mean that X are individuals that are tall in our C context. Um, John is very tall will be false if John is in the negative extension of tall for tall individuals. And uh, John is very tall will be undefined is John is not in the positive extension of tall in our original context, in the context not modified by, by there yet. So it's easy to see how we can uh, um, ex easily con extend it to precision cases. The only thing that we need to say is that uh, uh, the extent that uh, the, uh, the scale that is usually provi provided by uh, by predicate uh, like uh, like tall will be provided by the noun phrase itself. And um, uh, extending that to um, uh, emphatic definite descriptions and modification of same will take a little trick. We'll say that um, uh, in this case what very modifies is not the um, any gradable property with there is none in the dp but a propositional component within a dp and it does it whereas other degree modifiers don't as, as exactly because it has this property of jumping into the context changing the comparison class there and coming back into the back into the semantics so that would be our little trick to deal with the emphatic definite descriptions and uh, modification of same so um compositionally as i said the, we extend our semantics by introducing uh, in the object language uh, um, operators that can raise a usual extensional denotation into a function from um, from uh, context to to extensions, and it's it's a reverse that will do uh, the the opposite, and what we'll do uh, that's just the definitions. So what we do then we derive there at all as in 30, 39, we'll take, we're going to take tall, we're going to raise its extensional denotation into, as, and it, it, become, it will become a function from context to, uh, to extensions. Then we modify this function with very, which basically will say, okay, that you're the same thing, but now evaluate yourself not with respect to uh, whatever your comparison class was in the initial context, but in, in with respect to the positive denotation of yourself. 
and return back uh, the extensional denotation of, of tall. So it just changing, well, what is shown as this parameter on tall. From the very beginning will be the same thing. Um, doing absolutely the same, uh, uh, have an absolutely the same uh, uh, composition, com compositional structure and just modifying the, the way um, context, comparison class in the context is, uh, is defined. Not the way, but the comparison class itself. Um, the difference uh, between uh, two, uh, remember that there was a difference between uh, our, uh, um, our modification of tall and modification uh, and precision cases like beginning in that with tall, we can use other degree modifiers like extremely, really, but not with beginning. And the difference will come from the fact that with tall, I suggest, uh, from the fact that with tall, we also have this separate strategy of doing it with degrees. And that's what extremely and really are uh, operating on. Whereas with noun, we don't have that this additional degree argument with which we are going to, uh, to do the modification. As I said, for same and extremely, uh, and sorry, for same and uh, uh, emphatic definite descriptions, what we'll say is that there is some kind of uh, adjectival functional projection within a, def, a, a, a DP that brings the idea of salience or common relation in case of same, and it has been proposed uh, in the literature for, for same uh, in different guises, and salience, of course, is a, a very common way to express, so to, to um, construct different descriptions in linguistics. There is some evidence so there, that uh, it, it also has been done for uh, demonstratives in semantics. Uh, there is some evidence that these place in different descriptions are taken for a kind of adjectival thing that is doing the demonstration of picking up of the, of the referent, and it comes from colloquial Norwegian, that it's possible to say that here clock or that their house. So that's here or there, this, is, this will be uh, the place there, there is uh, operating. And uh, the, again, the, the trick that we'll do is that we'll say that this, as is, is, this is a presuppositional component, it will come already as a character. So application of our operators so uh, that raise it to, to, uh, to a character will not apply here. And this will explain uh, and of course, this guide does not have does not come with a uh, with a degree uh, argument. This will explain why we cannot use other degree modifiers. Uh, why we cannot um, because it's already a character function. Why it, this will explain why we cannot use it iteratively. And uh, um, for, for I'll, I'll skip the uh, explanation of the negative facts, but they, it's it just a an application of what um, uh, Klein says about Larry. So this is how our machine goes. With already with some with, with this uh, uh, with what I've just told you about linguistics, so uh, we can uh, make some linguistic conclusions uh, that will be interested for um, people who are doing hard work work on our machine and who want to fix it. What I will turn to is how we can use that as a tool. So one property that I haven't been talking about intuition about emphatic definite descriptions that I, I haven't been talking explicitly about so far is that it comes with a kind of surprise or unexpectedness, so then, then compared to a normal definite descriptions. Ash is talking to the man we met yesterday. 
is a normal sentence, but once you say, I was talking to the dairy man we met yesterday, there is some, some sense of surprise there. So what is unexpected is that the participant of the main utterance event talking, the man who uh, Ash is talking to, is identical to the man we met yesterday. Um, and that's what we are going to, to play with, with uh, for the rest of the, uh, of the talk. So of course this uh, uh, surprise or unexpectedness intuition is also, is also shared with, uh, uh, with Tal. Uh, if we, it's easy to see if you think about uh, in, in terms of uh, normal distribution, think about tall people. So people who are falling into that very tall people part of the of normal distribution are well, not uh, surprising and unprobable and unexpected. So a very tall man is given our normal distribution is a surprising, surprising event, so to speak. Um, if we come back to uh, emphatic definite descriptions, well, salience is not the easiest, at least for me, term to think in this uh, way with the, uh, this kind of uh, normal distribution uh, scenario, but think about it as recognizability of being able to pick up the referent. So what very will be doing in emphatic definite description, it will say that, okay, your referent is uh, salient, it's recognizable, but the recognizable event is somehow unexpected. So again, it is in the same uh, comparison class or it's in, 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 the in, in the same extension with a, with a raised comparison class. So that's how unexpectedness is coming about. And this unexpectedness is the tool that I propose we use to tackle or to probe into things that are sometimes called as continuous and non-continuous observation. So, uh, I am very uncomfortable on the philosophical grounds. So um, I will not be talking too much about philosophy on, and mention probably only those who are closer to linguistics. So, um, but the idea is the following. Uh, in, um, in his book, Individuals, Straussen talks about identity. And uh, of course he distinguishes between talking and type identity. So in this figure, if we say that uh, uh, the figure in the top left hand corner is the same as the one in the um, low right hand corner, we mean type same. But if we say, if, if we say that the figure in the, left, in the left top corner is the same as uh, the one with the, uh, with the circle beneath and um, with the rectangle on the right, we are talking about type, uh, talking identity. And what Straussen says is that, well, it seems that it's very, we can very reliably distinguish between talking and type identity in case of, uh, um, of continuous observation. But he raises the question whether in case of discontinuous observation, we can do the same or only what we have in, in uh, discontinuous observation is the case of different types of, um, of type identity. So of course that raises, uh, that, that brings uh, questions about uh, skepticism and uh, uh, Straussian works to, um, to argue against those claims. But the question remains, oh, do we, can we reliably distinguish between talking and type identity with discontinuous observation? 
or is there anything behind this um, behind this intuition recently um, um not really recently but uh, the idea that it's closer to being testable in linguistics is um, uh, it comes from Corta and Perry from the uh, critical pragmatics that use what they call a detachment recognize information game. They, they construct scenarios that we have a discontinuous observation, discontinuous observation that we have uh, what I will call a detached reference. And again, for them, uh, that also might raise uh, the uh, worries about skepticism and they, um, uh, they reject them. But let's look at the scenario, how they propose to think about those sentences. So imagine that you are in your office and you go to the kitchen at, uh, adjacent to your office so to fix yourself a cup of coffee, just the way you like it. And um, you take your favorite cup with a picture of Nietzsche on it. Then your phone rings in the in your office. You need to return to your office um, and you leave the cup behind. A bit later, you return, pick up the cup, drink from it, and fully expect that there will be exactly the coffee that uh, you fixed for yourself. As I said, in, for, in, in the, the, the way their system works, is that this will not bring questions of skepticism because what they're saying is that uh, uh, the difference is not, um, because what they say is that we recognize the cup, not because of how our system is set up, not because how our kitchen is set up, how the cup is, uh, um, is set up or we, because the, this, the observation of the system is dis, uh, discontinued, but we pick up the, the references because of the roles they play, those objects play in the actions that we perform. And they go uh, to explain that um, we, um, we recognize the cup or we, um, assign a role to the cup where, in, in which we are preparing our coffee and uh, then we store this cup with related to this role and then we pick up this cup because of its role, not because of the system uh, in which it, situ it, it was situated. So now remember our emphatic definite descriptions. And we said that what they signal is that very, what very signals in them is that our recognition of the referent is unexpected, unlikely, somehow surprising. So what if in case of detached reference where indeed our recognition of the referent is somehow less certain than with continuous observation. If this is the case, then linguistic intuition would be that very is degraded in those scenarios. So, I mean, it, that it will be degraded in the scenarios that it's certain, but will be it will be improved then, uh, then we have the detached reference. So um, detached ref in, in touch reference scenarios. So again, uh, we, we saw with linguistic, uh, with linguistic evidence that very is licensed there in unlikely or surprise the, the event with this particular referent is unlikely or surprising. So if there is a difference between continuous observation and detached reference, that and detached reference is in detached reference, we have a harder time, it becomes unlikely 
to recognize the referent, then we expect that in these cases, very will be used, but in cases there it's absolutely, in continuous observation there, it's absolutely fine to recognize the same referent, very will be degraded, will be out. Clearly, uh, it is 5.30. Thank you, yes. So that's, uh, I have two, oh, actually three scenarios to go through. So it won't take much time, but I really appreciate your input on, on that. So English, of English, sorry, uh, linguistic data and uh, intuitions are super, super noisy. That's why the scenarios of vignettes as so uh, in, uh, in, in philosophy you call them, are somewhat elaborate. And I'm sure I haven't got rid of all the noise there yet, but imagine the following. Imagine that you work as an assistant in a psychologic facility, psychiatric facility, and your job is to observe Johnny, who has a very rare obsession about books. If he sees a book, he starts reading it. So we're keeping him in a room without any print materials. Every day you come to his room with a book and you observe his behavior. So today as well, you come uh, uh, with a book, place it on the table. As expected, Johnny immediately comes to the table, takes the book and starts reading it. While still looking at Johnny, you take your voice recorder out and record. It's 8.03. Johnny is reading the very book I brought in. I don't have exper experimental evidence to report, so I can only report intuitions of uh, those speakers that I uh, consulted, and they say that it's degraded compared to a, not a simple sentence that Johnny is reading the um, Johnny is reading the book I brought in. Now, compare this scenario to a detached reference scenario. Uh, the beginning is the same. You are the same uh, um, psychiatric assistant. You're working with Johnny who has a very obsession of, uh, about books. Once he sees a book, he starts reading it. So we keep him in, uh, in a room without any print materials. Every day you come to his room with a book and observe his behavior. Today, you also come to his room. Uh, you place the book on the table. Uh, as expected, Johnny immediately comes to the table and start, uh, takes the book and starts reading it. At this moment, you hear some noise in the corridor. You go to the door. You look outside. Make, you make sure that your help is not needed there. You return to Johnny who is still reading that book, you take out your recorder and you record eight or three journeys reading the dairy book I brought in. I know that it's hard that I'm talking to get the, or to even to test your own intuitions, but again, as I was told that this is now very here is not as strange as it was in the continuous observation scenario above. So the, this unexpectedness um, uh, can, th that license so the use of very can be uh, let in into scenario with different, uh, with different ways. That's why it's so elaborate. So if we, if we say that Johnny has books around him, very reportedly becomes more acceptable. If we introduce another interlocutor, let's say that you are not recording it, but you are talking to your um, friend assistant, it also, that and the judgments also fluctuate. Uh, and you can straightforwardly set your expectations as a neutral expectation. And this is in 50, Six, I'm, I will not go over it. But once you change your expectations, this also helps to license, in a sense, very. So 
I don't have a conclusion and the last bullet point is a very hedgy one, but if those observations are on the right track and if we can construct vignettes so that we clean up the noise and have this experimentally tested and the data comes out the way um, we hope it does, then using linguistic intuitions, we can probably test our intuitions about how people reason in those cases, continuous and discontinuous observation. So, and this is a kind of thing that I want to put on the table that we can use the wealth of linguistic knowledge now to construct, now that we know how many things in language work, to construct ways to test, maybe not all, but at least some intuitions that philosophers raise and, ra and argue for and against using just analytical tools they have. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yuli. Um, if you have questions for her, please raise your hands. Peter. Peter, we cannot hear you. Peter, we are not hearing you. You are mute. Can you unmute him, Dave? There we go. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I wonder if, in addition to a sense of surprise and unlikelihood, um, there's also a sense that uh, th this is one among many alternatives. So, of course, one among many alternatives would get you the surprise or the unlikelihood, but um, I th you could manufacture cases in which there's an element of surprise, but there's only one of the thing in, in kind. So I'm walking down the street with you and I say, that's the unicorn we were talking about, right? Where there's only one unicorn in town, right? Would you say that's the very unicorn? Well, it's not as obvious as in the case where you say we're talking about a particular dog and we're in a dog park, right? And we see the dog in question that I was talking about. I go, hey, that's the very dog I was talking about. So I feel a little bit that in addition to a sense of surprise, which you get from unicorns and unlikelihood, there all it also has to be kind of one out of a of a class of alternatives. Do you feel that? I I do, but I'm not sure that 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 comes from I from Vera. Do you have the same for just a definite description? Uh, with the well, that that's the union from that, that's the dog, right? But that's the in the dog case, I said that's the very dog I was talking about, yeah, right. And I don't feel the need to use very in the case of the unicorn, right? Because uh, it's not like the very unicorn I was talking about, it's the unicorn I was talking about. If there was only one unicorn in the universe, there's only the one unicorn, yeah, in the world. Them. That's that's the. I don't know. I need to check. And yeah, I, I need to check and and feel quietly about like think quietly yeah, about. Yeah, you need a you need a quiet place to think about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but that's a very yeah. Thank you. That's that, that's a very interesting thing. I will I will check. Maybe that adds kind of the noise that I was talking about too, Could that be. 
you need to be in a universe with at least not, not, not one individual. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's, it's coming from very, or it's coming from different descriptions in general. So um, yeah, thanks so much. I will, I will note it and I will okay. quietly think about it. It's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Brenda. Yeah, Brenda. Sorry, I was my daughter. So thank you very much, Julie. It was uh, really a fascinating uh, phenomenon what, what, uh, what we are analyzing here. Uh, what I really, uh, I mean, one of the things I find uh, really bluffing is uh, this use of the Baltic self uh, for, for expressing uh, uh, degrees. But uh, I, I will have much more down to earth questions, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I do not trust my intuitions about English. But let's let's check if the other have the same intuitions. And I don't know. I, I don't think you talked about that. Maybe you did. And I, um, you see, uh, as for same, I, I try to organize a little bit my remarks. Now this is, this will be the first remark. You know that same has a uh, nominal same has this what used to be called sentence internal readings. In the sentence mm -hmm. internal readings. The two arguments of the identity mm -hmm. relation are given by, by a plurality mm -hmm. in the center. No? So mm -hmm. Mary and John made the same captain. Every participant mm -hmm. made the, the, the same remark. When she's in Paris, Mary often stays at the same hotel and so on. Now, probably I don't have the right intuitions, but anyway, I do not think that the very same construction can work here. No, that's as far as I know. Do, you, 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 you do not get a sentence internal written with, with the very it is not. same. No, 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 no. It's, it's the only day, yeah, I, I didn't mention it. It's, the, uh, or maybe I, I, well, I have it somewhere, but I, I didn't uh, say it. It's the deictic same that is used there. The internal reading of same, and again, it's the internal reading of same is not uh, is not part of this of this world at all. Well, we are dealing with same that is for most of the. Well, I, 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 at some point, I believed that for all speakers in very same, the very same car, is the token reading, token dict anaphoric dictic reading of same. So type reading is out and um and and the internal reading of same is out too. But recently I was told that some English speakers got a type reading with the mm -hmm. very same the very mm -hmm. same book. He's reading the very same book. With a meaning uh, one piece and not the very same copy of uh, one piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now I, 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 I'm not as confident saying that is talking, only talking reading is possible, but it's, it's definitely the salient one. But I'm for now, nobody reported to me, and I don't get it myself, that they have the internal reading once they introduce uh -huh. Mary. I see, I see, I, so see, I see. If anybody from the audience get it, so the, the phenomena that Brenda is talking about is that they use very with two uh, eventualities. So you have Mary reading the book and John reading the book, and you say something like Mary and John and John reading the same book, meaning that the same is the book and well, Mary's book is identical to John's book. There is external reading or dialectic, dialectic reading is that you, then you say that, then you know that I, I read one piece and you say, oh, John is reading the same book, mm -hmm. referring anaphorically to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the book that is out in the discourse mm -hmm. or outside the, the same sentence. So again, I was, um, I have no reports of people who say that John and Mary written the same, the very same book means that Mary's book is identical to John's book. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good point. I, again, I, for now, the answer is no, but who knows? Maybe mm -hmm. I, I haven't asked every English speaker. Because maybe the, the intuition would be if, if it was if it were impossible 
to get sentence internal readings for the very same, then you really know that these are referential expressions. I mean, that, uh, I mean they, are, that they are not sort of covert uh, indefinites that, that are being compared and then I'm mean, sort of, sort of, and the other thing probably is also, I don't know that that is again, intuitions of, of, native, uh, of native speakers of English, but uh, that the very same can alternate with uh, the demonstrative, that very same, yeah. is it okay? Mm -hmm. uh, for <laughs> some things, yeah, something for what you cannot also get a sentence internal reading that is out. Well, in languages that do not mm -hmm. have, there, there seems to be why mm -hmm. I'm talking about this, to be internal, Demonst demonstrative mm. adjective or something is that in languages that do not have articles like mm. Slavic languages, you cannot use it without an article. So you do have to to have a demonstrative there. Okay. okay. You cannot okay. say things like self book self man we saw yesterday. You need okay. to say that self man we okay. saw yesterday. Okay. So okay. there should be something that comes okay. in. Okay. 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 So. And now the, the 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 other remark I had, the second remark I had, is about your intermediate or precision case. Uh, if I remember correctly, you illustrated it with the noun beginning hmm, at the very mm -hmm. beginning and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, couldn't it be that beginning has sort of a scalar structure to it? Because beginning is is, is an interval, and, in, and intervals are a time interval, and, and they are ordered. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have, 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 no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean. It, it, so, in in a certain way, the intermediate case would be a very applied to cases of nouns that do have a scale, a scalar denotation. Absolutely, yeah, yes, okay, absolutely. Great, that, that, great. That, okay, that, that then I, I understand. Okay, 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 okay. Then the, the only difference that, that the only problem for me would be mm -hmm. is that uh, what I would have to say mm -hmm. like for to explain linguistically mm -hmm. is that those nouns do not have a degree argument because that's what excludes things like the extremely beginning or the yeah, really but, beginning. Yeah, yes, but the idea would be that you can have scalar structure without absolutely absolutely yes okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's okay. exactly okay. That's, that's, that, okay. that's the idea okay okay, okay. yeah yeah that's and idea. i think that there's there's even experimental work been uh, having been done on that i mean I, i'll check for the references for this oh, idea that, that, really yeah, appreciate for this idea that yeah. some nouns do have a scalar structure but they do not have a degree structure okay that's, oh that uh, would be wonderful if you can I, share it I, I think it is i think it is dio and pinyang i'll check for that i'll but I, I find that for you because I, I found it very, very interesting work. Uh, and uh, the very last question. Uh, do you, could you think of a way of treating the very man as the very same man or it is out? I mean, that for the very man having a sort of hidden same. Oh, that was the initial idea that I had. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. But, uh, I'm again. I I don't have good evidence to say that it is well with covered structure. It's it's tricky. So mm -hmm. I don't have good evidence. I need to think. Oh, if you have an idea that I, no, I no, no, I don't. Just just how to show <laughs> how to show that it's yeah. it's a same rather than yeah. something like. Um, yeah an old and standard and sweet salience so, or any other okay. suppositional part mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. piece that mm -hmm. we, already, we know that are already there and we establish them and they we know how they live and how they how they behave mm -hmm. so i don't have a good reason to, uh, to 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 change it at this point but i did like i did start from that idea that it's a, just a covert same um yeah, but I no good arguments there. In terms of no, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for your answers. They were enlightening, and, and I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brandon. In terms... Oh, I, I I retracted my hand because uh, I, I I thought my question would be too stupid. Uh, so, yeah.
you can ask the viewer. Mm-hmm. Can... Yeah, I mean, I, would I have a natural it. inclination to try to get that at the conflict. Conflict. So, for example, beautiful. you yeah. have. Oh, so you have the expletive reading. Like, if I say, um, well, here, here's the attempt I, I got where the scalar mm-hmm. and an expletive reading is combined in a grotesque fashion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, a scalar reading might be um, the very heart of the issue. Uh, we're getting to the very heart of the issue here, and presumably Hart has, uh, you know, a, an argument there, and yeah, um, and we could also be in a hospital, and you know, I'm a surgeon, I'm conducting heart surgery, and I say that's the very heart I'm looking for, um, and so, and obviously, heart in the first case has been used in a kind of metaphorical sense, and in the mm-hmm. second case, it's literally a human heart that we're talking about, but then I thought, well. Is there a way where we're all debating what the very heart of the issue is? Um, and I construct a case where I say, oh, but that's the very, very heart of the issue, where two of these are operating on top of each other, but I couldn't get my grammaticality intuitions to uh, give me a, a useful result. So I, I that, and, and so I lowered my hand. Um, <laughs> but oh, like in, I in the, to, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But, but it, 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 it just seemed that I was trying to figure out what would the structure be then uh, for heart, because heart is presumably um, the, the, the noun either has an argument in it that is playing the scalar role or it doesn't. And if, but yeah, I don't think this is a useful line of inquiry. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, Shut up, sorry. No, that's that's one. It's uh, um, the my intuition is that the very, very heart I am operating on should be bad, but uh, it's the very, very heart of the you, 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 you got my the very, very heart of the of the issue is should be fine. So that that would be like, like the very, very beginning versus the um, Ex- extremely heart of the issue would be impossible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah extreme. but it's a beautiful example. I can use it with your permission to show the difference <laughs> between because it's it's the same uh, the same DP that are very hard because and I, that's the very hard I'm operating on or that are very hard I'm operating on is um, it's a very good example. Thank you. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you very much, Julie, for such a nice talk and. We will be back in seven minutes, more or less.